Dr. Taz, MD. Yeah. Our real name is Tazneem Bhatia, MD. Um, this is Adrian Nolan Smith from Welby, and I am very excited to be in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes. Interviewing um, now, I think, a friend of mine, yes, which is of terrific, <laughs> um, Dr. Taz, who many of you may already know. Um, she's a fantastic functional medicine doctor. Um, she's the author of multiple books, including her newest, which I have right here, which is Superwoman RX. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about what that's about and how it can help you. Um, and she's also an acupuncturist, certified nutritionist, mom and wife. Um, so very excited to have her on uh, with me today. So first thing I want to ask you, because so much of my mission and what I've been doing with Wellbe is related to helping to bring awareness around what's possible. So I've been telling stories of health recovery through integrative yes. medicine, um, because I think one way to inspire people is to show proof. Um, yes, definitely. And of course, another piece of it is getting to hear from great experts who have been treating people in this way and therefore also bringing proof that this stuff is possible and that you can really heal your body naturally with, you know, putting the right inputs in and removing the wrong inputs. And you have such, you have your own story that matches that, which is yeah. so amazing, you know, and we've talked about that before too. So you're a living testament to all of this. Yes, I hope so. Um, and I try to keep up with everything I'm doing to make sure that I stay on the success side yes. of things. Um, but yes, I was actually on Dr. Taz's podcast a little while ago telling my story. And so I was very excited to not only get all of the knowledge from her that she has being um, an integrative physician, but also hear a little bit of her story because I think like so many of us, it comes from personal experience yes. and realizing what's Definitely. wrong and hitting a little bit of a rock bottom before you decide to really do something about it and, and help others, which I've learned is also kind of like a a female quality, you know, you, once you've seen a better way, it's, it's, we're all nurturers at the end of the exactly. day. Right? Yeah, we want to help. So we want to help. Um, so tell, so tell me about your health journey. I know you had one and sort of how you healed and what happened. I would love to tell it. I think it pales in comparison to yours, quite honestly. I felt like you went through so much more, but you know, mine was just a lot of what I'm seeing nowadays, you know, in young women as well is just the combination of being super stressed. I was in medical school you know, I was going into residency, my eating was off, my sleep was off, I didn't know how to take care of myself, I didn't really know anything about my health, quite honestly, and all of a sudden just started getting what today I know are more inflammatory symptoms, but at that time I had no clue, like I would have joint pain, I, would, I was gaining weight and didn't understand why, I had horrible acne, and then I started to lose hair, and the hair loss became you know, more and more progressive until it really crescendo and became something that everybody noticed, like it wasn't where you could hide it anymore. And even though it was happening and even though it was so visible, I'm still, you know, when I look back, I still wonder, I still didn't really, I still wasn't motivated to figure it out. I think I was so in my head and just so determined to like power through and, you know, I've got to get to my shift and I've got to do this and I've got to do that, that I just thought this would go away and it would, it would just magically disappear. It just clues you in into how tiny things, tiny shifts, because ultimately it came down to food, quite honestly. It came down to, I needed to be gluten-free, my thyroid was shot, I needed iron, I needed B vitamins. And as long as I kind of stayed there, then even to this day, so many years later, I'm good, I feel pretty good and I'm healthy. The minute I fall off again, those signs come back. So yeah, I mean like the, you know, just the idea that tiny things can shift your health so dramatically was fascinating to me because in Western medicine, remember I was working in the emergency room and I, you know, I had ICU on the brain. I was going to go be an ICU doctor and all this other stuff. Those are heroic efforts. We do a lot, right? I mean, there's like 50 things to do at any one given time. And, I, and when you're sitting back and looking at this field of medicine, it's like, oh my gosh, tiny things shift the body so dramatically and affect so many different pathways. And it takes you away from hero medicine, kind of. It takes you more into like, okay, let's work with the body, not like jump in as like this savior that like we're going to do 50,000 things and then get everybody to where they need to be, you know, so. Right. It's almost like, you know, the idea of, I just watched the whole Ken Burns yes, Vietnam yeah. documentary, yeah. so it's like war is on my mind. Yeah. But, you know, the difference of like diplomacy seems so, you know, kind of, insignificant when you think about dropping a bomb or like actually how yes. you can go and do something like heroic as a lot of soldiers grew up thinking right. you know they wanted to be that like tough guy and right. go and fight and actually like have a weapon but in reality like diplomacy ends up 
doing a lot more, even though it seems much softer. Absolutely. It's... Um, and I think a lot of doctors see the the shows, you know, they watch Grey's Anatomy yeah. and like, that's <laughs> almost like the adrenaline rush of totally. that, like, you know, wanting to save people that way. And yeah. really most of our issues today are chronic related and so you're able to save people from years of health problems more than you know when they're already in the ICU right it's kind of like it's not, too late it's a little I mean too late. Yeah. and I also found that that experience as a doctor is was not rewarding it's like the adrenaline rush right you get that adrenaline surge because you've done all these different procedures or you know whatever else but it wears off because at the end of the day there's no connection you know there was no connection there's no relationship I didn't get to see somebody like go from zero to 10 to 20 to 50 to 100. I didn't get to watch that process, you know, and it became very transactional. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this, you're going to do that, and that's the end of our relationship. And I just found that, like, I was tiring of it just from a, a career standpoint, you know, that that wasn't going to be the long-term fit for me. Gaslighting is a woman going to a doctor and complaining of certain pain or symptoms and being told, like, oh, nothing's wrong with you or, like, just, you know, not taking a certain thing seriously that right. was sort of an emergency or even like a lot of the stories I've filmed it's you know it's Lyme disease or it's lupus or it's um, you know some other kind of thyroid condition or a toxic drug reaction and you know they went to several male doctors who kind of said you just have mental issues mm -hmm. and so that's like this uh, other scary part of totally, gaslighting is yeah. then they, you know, obviously feel the need to then medicate right. you. And so right. instead of, you know, getting to the root cause. and There's still not the dollar amount being put into women's health that there is being put into other areas of health, you know. So the concern there is how do we get out of, you know, and even just looking at my colleagues, quite honestly, and who's making decisions in big in, you know, the NIH or in all of these places, it's still male-dominated, right? I mean, medicine is just now shifting to where we have an equal number of women and men going into medicine. We probably will have more women than men going into medicine. But again, the usual variable with all of us is that a lot of us, when we start having children, we drop and we drop to part-time. So a lot of times we're still not active participants in the policy changes that need to happen to support women's health or in the advocacy that needs to happen or in just looking at medicine in a maternal way rather than a paternalistic way, right? So a very male way to look at medicine is like you go from point A to point B to point C and it's this linear road and there's no other gray zones, nothing else. You know, there can't be any other possibilities because this is what this says and this is what science says and, you know, and that's the only way to go. Whereas, you know, the maternal model, model or the female model is more holistic. It's more like, okay, well, what about these intricacies? You know, what about this factor over here? You know, what about your relationships? How is that impacting your chemistry? We're more likely to think naturally that way. So until we have more women in the decision-making chairs, medicine is going to continue to be this very paternalistic model where women's health issues will be gaslit, they'll be pushed to the side. So that's where the concept comes from. And unfortunately, it's still not, it's still not completely solved or, or, or removed. We're still very much in a gaslit medical culture, for sure. And the sad part is even our female physicians, you know, because again, we're all kind of indoctrinated. I mean, I don't know, I was too. And, you know, it's funny to even watch the younger guys come out and some of them will rotate with us or even my sisters who are young doctors now. When they first come out, when we all first come out, we're like, well, this is the way. This is the only way. This is the only information. This is the only way to make things happen or to do things. But then as you have your own experiences in clinical practice, either with yourself or with patients, you realize that there's not just one way to do things, you know, and you've got to be open-minded into bringing other things into the fold to solve problems. And then we as women are the biggest victims of that because we are so fluid and flexible all the time. We are hormonal. We do 50 different things in any given lifetime. So, you know, for us to be put in these boxes where this is the only way absolutely doesn't work. Yes, for sure. So I want to ask you, since you're on this sort of other side of medicine now, but obviously looking back at how conventional doctors are still practicing, do you think it's, you know, should be a moral responsibility taught in medical school that a doctor should keep trying to kind of search for a root cause or pass you to somebody they think might be able to? Or is oh, it okay yeah. to just say I mean, like, 
you know, no. nothing's wrong with you. Well, here's the problem. I mean, I think medical education has to be overhauled. I mean, we got maybe an hour of nutrition information when I went through medical school, maybe an hour. I'm not even sure we got a full hour. So the actual education has to be overhauled. There's a lot of politics in medical education, so it's going to be a machine that's hard to change. You only will change the mindset of the emerging doctor when you change the education system. So yes, there's a lot to do there, but there's also a lot to do when you come out of practice where doctors, I think, themselves should have that natural innate curiosity or inquisitiveness of, well, let's not be so closed-minded. Let's just not shut the door you know, to things that we may not know or may not understand or may not have studied you know, and just assume that everything else is bad. So. The answer is yes, but I know how big the machine is and I know how deep the machine is. And so changing it is, is tough. And, you know, as a new young, you know, there's a lot of excitement when you get into medical school, right? There's like, oh my gosh, I did it. You know, it's such a draining process to get in and it's such a draining process to get out. So there's a lot of like internal celebration. You're not emotionally or physically ready to question the system at that time. That takes that takes a long time, you know. So, yes, I think we collectively need to work on changing medical education. We need to work on changing continuing education of what happens with doctors when they come out. But all of that is wrapped up in the healthcare machine as it stands today. So, yes. I I saw that up close and personal too. I'm sure. But, all right. So, I want to ask you based on your work with you know, in women's health, um, I know you focus primarily on seeing women mm -hmm. in your practice um, and this whole topic of gaslighting. There are certain conditions I saw that were more, you know, often not being diagnosed properly. PCOS, endometriosis, uterine fibroids, like pain during sex, like yep. all these things. So I'm curious, why do you think those are not being properly diagnosed and why are they so common today? And what, you know, what have you kind of seen with your patients on that? Absolutely. So yeah, I do work with so many women. I work with children too, but just because the Chinese medicine philosophy is you never separate a woman mm -hmm. and a child. You always treat the two together because the health of one impacts the other and vice versa. Things like PCOS, fibroids, endometriosis, all of these things are hormone conditions. Basically, they're conditions of either estrogen dominance, high androgens, changing insulin levels. So essentially, I can lump them all into probably one big box, although every patient's story is unique and everyone's chemistry is individual. But the big box is that there's just hormone disruption. And there's blatant hormone disruption across the board, across ages. I will. You know, this actually really bothered me. I haven't shared this with anyone yet, but I did do uh, labs on my daughter just recently who is 10, you know, about to turn 11. And I'm like, she's changing, you know, let me just get some lab work. Let me understand her estrone level for a girl who hasn't even started her period yet is higher than mine. Estrone is a metabolite of estrogen. It shows us how our body is either accumulating estrogen, storing estrogen, or metabolizing estrogen. And so I'm only giving you that story to give you the example of how inundated we are today in terms of exogenous hormones that we're getting in, hormones from the environment, from our food, you know, from our water, from everything that we're surrounded by, while at the same time our conditions of hormone imbalance are not properly diagnosed. So you've got this, again, twofold thing. You've got this environmental burden, but then at the same time you have the medical system that doesn't know how to diagnose it yet. So all the conditions that you just listed out, PCOS, endometriosis, fibroids, again, they're hormonally based, but they're the influence of our environment. They're the influence of our lifestyles. We are seeing more and more young women with infertility, PCOS, endometriosis, fibroids, all of these things that historically, A, we didn't see as much, or we would not see it till maybe your 40s or your 50s or something along those lines. So again, I'm super passionate about getting young girls, young women, the information they need, because I really think it, it totally dictates their health journey. Something on this, this woman's health topic was about the Netflix uh, documentary that just came out called The Bleeding Edge about the medical device industry yeah, um, and how it was a lot of these situations with um, the uh, the mesh, the gynecological yes. mesh, and yes. then the Assure yep. IUD and these women being like, I'm in serious pain, like something is not right and right. being kind of told, it's okay. Don't worry, that happens in the beginning. Right. Or, you know, like I see that now with the IUDs. I get a lot of complaints on the IUDs. Something's not right. I'm not feeling good after it went in. I gained 20 pounds after it went in. And I think it's being gaslit also. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. And there's a lot of you know women now suing with these class action suits. But I wanted to ask 
you, since this is, I think, helpful for anybody listening who might be a woman or thinking right. about an IUD, like what is your feeling on them and sort of what do you advise patients? Because I would think they would cause a lot of, you know, inflammation in the body yeah. and I'm always trying to get rid of inflammation. Right. So I'm curious. I think anytime you insert anything, any sort of artificial device, there's always going to be a risk of inflammation. And that's everything from an IUD to a knee replacement to any of these things because we're introducing foreign substances into the body. Now, what each person does with that is individual. People, for example, with MTHFR, which is a gene that dictates kind of how you detox and how you metabolize things, they do horribly with these things because there's metal in, in something like an IUD. You know, there are different chemicals in it. The body reacts to it. It sees it, as, sees it as foreign, wants to invade it, wants to attack it. You change your metabolic mode. I had a patient yesterday who said ever since her IUD went in, she gained literally like 30 pounds within the space of three to four months. And she's being told by her doctors, well, maybe you need to go back and look at your diet. And she's like, no, it happened after the IUD went in. So again, everyone's reaction to some of these modern techniques is different, you know, and, and we, I don't think 100% understand, like from a conventional medicine standpoint, how to sift through that. So I'm not trying to assign blame to anyone. But the only issue there is that when patients are having reactions, when you as a patient or a consumer, however you want to look at yourself, is having an issue, don't also be you know, convinced that it's not what you think it is. Your intuition often is correct and it's right. So yeah, I'm not a fan of any of it. Ideally, we like live purely and cleanly and not have you know, IUDs and artificial knees and artificial hips and all these other things, but sometimes things are necessary to move through life. But IUD is, I'm, I'm not a huge fan and we're putting it in younger and younger girls as well. We're putting it now, I think now it's the number one recommended form of birth control for teenage girls. And I have issues with that as well. You know, you've got yeah. these young women getting IUDs in. Some of them will be okay with it, but some of them are going to have toxicity issues with it as well. And also, as a birth control method, that's not protecting against sexually transmitted no, diseases. And so all. as a teenager, yeah. I think that's your number one that's worry. Number like, one. I mean, exactly. That's the main thing. So. Um, yeah. Wow. That is... I did not know that. That's a little terrifying. Okay. I want to shift gears and talk about your book. Yes. Because um, it's it's a really interesting title. I took the quiz. Yay. Where um, are you? I, I unfortunately got to... I was on the airplane coming down yeah. and I was like looking at your yeah. site and I got to 15 and we started descending. Oh, no. And I was like, no, oh. I can't. Finish. I never found out my okay, type, but I'll it. finish it <laughs> okay. or I'll do it over or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's so Superwoman RX yeah. and it kind of ties into a lot of the things we're talking about today, which is kind of taking back your health, taking back the power to yes. determine your destiny, I think. But yes. I want to hear more about, you know, why you wrote it and what, what it's, you know, helping people do. Definitely. So again, remember I'm coming at women's health with all these different angles, right? I'm conventionally trained, but at the same time I have the background in Chinese medicine and nutrition and Ayurveda and all this other great stuff. So as I started my practice and started seeing patients, the majority of whom were women, you know, you get to a point where you're like, wait a minute, like all these things are lining up. What Ayurveda says, what Chinese medicine says, what my lab work says, what the hormone imbalances are, this woman's personality, her emotional makeup, it's all kind of starting to fit together. And once I noticed it, then of course you start tracking it and you start to pay attention, like, you know, so if this person is Pitta, then what are they in Chinese medicine? You know, what is their lab? What are their common complaints? And so as I did that over and over and over again, there really were patterns. And what occurred to me is that the beauty of Eastern systems of medicine is that they give us a toolbox before you even enter to visit the doctor or go schedule your labs or imaging studies or whatever else. They give us this, it's almost like a gift of all this information that we could use to understand what's happening with us and why we might be the way we are, you know? And it's with total acceptance. People ask me all the time, which type is better than the others? I'm like, they're all on an equal plane. It's not that one person's better than the other. It's just that this is who we are and we have to accept who we are and then modify like our food and diet and you know exercise lifestyle around who we essentially are so as i did this over and over again i realized that there are five key types of women and then we gave each type a fun name but each type has a chinese meridian diagnosis an ayurvedic diagnosis a distinct hormone pattern a distinct way they should be eating you know a way to exercise a way to sleep and then strengths and weaknesses you know and some of those are personality driven some of those are emotional but that's who they are the boss lady is always going to be for example that's one of the types that's always going to be that very like 
gung-ho, I'm going to go from point A to point B to point C and lead a team and lead people, but they burn themselves out to a crisp. They hold all of that in their abdomen. You know, they have inflammation. They're very pitta-dominant, you know, so they have some of these tendencies, whereas, you know, somebody like the, the nurturer, which is the earth mama, you know, they are different. They identify themselves by their surroundings, you know, and they live. I have an earth mama upstairs, actually, is that other? <laughs> but they live to really take care of everybody else. That's their identity, you know, and that's their self-esteem and their pride, but they don't set boundaries. So they're prone to depression. They're prone to diabetes. They're prone to cardiometabolic issues. So it's just, it was fun, part fun, but part serious. And what I really wanted to do, though, was begin that conversation for every woman with themselves. Like, who am I? Like, what do I need to be doing to take care of myself? Because the information out there seems overwhelming. I think a change, I've been in practice now 10 years in um, the integrative world, and it's gone from, okay, I don't know what you're talking about to I kind of know what you're talking about, but I still have no idea how to navigate it, you know? And so the information is overwhelming and people just need a roadmap. It's important to check in with yourself to give yourself the motivation to make changes. So that's in the book as well. There are a ton of recipes. There are over, I think, 50 or 60 recipes in the book. So it's a great cookbook if you want it just for that. And then there's sleep, reg I mean, there's beauty regimens, exercise regimens, you know, like all kinds of things. I just wanted it to be a resource for women. And then the other point I always make with the types is that people think that, okay, same thing, Western medicine thought we're one type, we're always going to be that type. That's not true because the biggest issue with women is, again, that we're fluid and we're flexible and we change, like our roles change, what we do changes, our hormones change. So you may flex types, and I've seen that a lot too. You may go from a nightingale to an earth mama or from a boss lady to a savvy chick or things like that. You can definitely change your type depending on where you are. So it's important to keep revisiting it and reevaluating yourself over and over again. Yeah, and also seeing when you're doing things in life that aren't connecting with or yes. serving your your like your natural type. type. Exactly. I had a lady yesterday tell me she's a stay-at-home mom. She's her children. She's on an empty nester, and she she typed out as a boss lady. And she's like, it finally made so much sense. She goes, I've been really unhappy, and I think. I did my best when I was working and I was like, you know, in charge and leading people. And she goes, this flip to being this, you know, kind of maternal person has been hard. It hasn't been easy, you know, so I found that interesting as well. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. And just trying to make sure that people are like, this sounds so cheesy, but sort of living their best life within yes. what that means to everyone. Because it seems like everybody has a completely different totally. idea of what that is totally, and what they yeah. need and all of that. Some people say to me, I don't know how you live in Manhattan. That pace would kill me. And then I have yeah. other people who say, like, it just gives me energy. energy I love yeah, it. You know, yeah. and it's like they're they're not both wrong. You right. know, it's just like right. that's important to recognize what you need and not do the opposite. Right. You will definitely. Exactly. You nailed it. Like um, really understand you, you know, and then set the boundaries for you. But at the same time carve out a life for you too, you know, like what does that mean in your relationships? It would be fun to do this like from a relationship standpoint, right? Can two boss, like the guy version of a boss lady, can they coexist, you know? I don't know, you know, so it would yeah. be fun to get into all of that as well, so. Yeah, I can't imagine that, but I'm sure that there's, you know, there's some power couples where, well, actually, you know, Angelina and, and Brad didn't work out, so maybe that's, that, maybe, maybe that was yeah, them. I'm not sure what their power <laughs> types are, but anyhow. <laughs> Gosh. Um, what's your power type? My power type, I'm a savvy chick. So I'm a blend between the first power type, which is a gypsy girl or the creative, and then the boss lady, which is sort of the, the more commander, go-getter type person. So, and I think I live that quite honestly. I mean, there are moments where, I mean, I know I have a lot of creativity in me and then I keep flip-flopping between this creative side and the side that needs to get things done or needs to lead or needs to be strategic. So I try to spend an equal amount of time in both spaces. Sometimes it doesn't always happen, but that is where I'm my happiest is when I'm doing both. And so medically, I have the issues of both. So they have adrenal and thyroid issues. My hormones play out that way. You know, nutritionally, they have B vitamin, fatty acid, and iron issues. My nutritional deficiencies play out that way for sure. And then I need that balance of like, from an exercise standpoint of like, you know, high intensity, but also balanced with something slower or slower paced. From a diet standpoint, I really need to be gluten free, which is a part of that, and very low on dairy, don't tolerate a lot of dairy either. So I fit my own type, which is great, but that is who I am. So that's my power type. Well, thank you so much for having me in your home. I'm so thank excited you. to be You're in Atlanta welcome. and You're for welcome. sitting down with me and the Wellbe audience to share all this great knowledge about how to take 
back your health um, every day and treat the hundred choices that you make a day as your health care is something that I yes. say a lot. But then when you are in a healthcare experience to, you know, look out for gaslighting to mm-hmm. make sure that you feel a connection to the person that's, you know, taking care of you. Definitely. And to make sure that you really are being heard. I think it's great the way that you're practicing and that you're hoping and trying to kind of bring this at a systemic level. Um, to change the medical education system and to really inspire younger doctors to go back to the basics and have relationships with their patients. So important. I hope we're able to do it, but it's really important. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.